You'll start waving. The time has come to push the button. Are we live? It's probably going to take a little bit of time until it's going to show on the broadcast, but let's see. We have zero viewers right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Nevertheless, hello, everybody. <laughs> hello to all the zero viewers. <laughs> and everyone who's going to rewatch oh, this. Wow. Now we're oh, wow. It's oh, 55. Fun. Okay. Awesome. We are improving. <laughs> Yes. That Same is actually pretty awesome. Germany, Hi, everyone. So many years. So welcome, everyone, to this joint product tank. And I am going to have the slides in here. Without further ado, i remove myself. I think. Alana, then it's up to us to introduce yes, the show tonight. A brief sneak peek of the organizing team. Um, yes, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to our joint product tank event uh, between Berlin and Hamburg. Uh, tonight, uh, yes, a quick introduction as to who we are. Um, so your Berlin hosts, uh, me, I'm senior product manager at Amazon. Um, we also have Sean Russell, a freelance product coach, and Dimitri, who is lead product manager at Wanda. Um, and from the Hamburg team, uh, we have Arne, uh, pro VP product at Zing, uh, Bertrand, a freelance PM, Anya from Adform, and Tobias, a product coach and consultant. Um, and all of these people have worked hard to bring you the event tonight. Um, so who is Product Tank? Uh, the world's largest product community. Uh, so started in 2010, now active in 200 cities around the world, you can see spread is truly across all continents. I don't think we have product tank to Antarctica, but maybe it will start. Um, yeah, built by products people for products people. So it really emphasis on the community. Um, it would there, so there's uh, the product tank, which is uh, meetups in 200 plus cities around the world. You can always go to the, mind, the product tank website or mind the product website and check where they are. Um, and on the other side, there's also the conferences. Uh, so there's a big conference in London, San Francisco, now Singapore. Um, and a quick shout out to the next official Mind the Product event in our area, which is the Mind the Product Engage Hamburg Leadership Forum on the 27th of September. Um, so if you want more information, it's available on the Mind the Product website, um, searchable on Google. Um, okay, like I said, this is all about community. So we would we'd love to have you here. We'd love to have you involved. Um, how you can get involved, you're welcome to speak at a product tank. You're welcome to host, you're welcome to sponsor. Uh, you can write for Mind the Product or find more information on the Mind the Product website to become a member and get access to even more great content. And with that, it's up to me to introduce you to our program tonight. So thanks very much, Alana. Um, I don't know how you all feel about 2021, but I bet for most of you, you will refer to it as being the exhausting second year of this pandemic. Uh, while I can totally relate to that, I also see a very different story here. So for me, 2021 has been the year of really great book releases uh, that have had a tremendous positive impact on our product community. Uh, one of those valuable books is called Continuous Discovery Habits, written by Teresa Torres. And in this book, you can learn beyond other important things about the opportunity solution tree framework that helps to visualize the opportunities you have to drive a desired outcome. Sure, we did our homework, as you can see, uh, for the show tonight. So with the desired outcome to help the product community up their discovery game in mind, we've identified three promising opportunities with our target group, so with you. First, the desire to learn more about product discovery in a light, wide way. Second, their pain over the lack of interaction with thought leaders to discuss personal views and challenges. And third, their need to dive deeper into the topic via easy to understand materials. We've thoroughly built our hypothesis and tested the most critical assumptions here. That's why I'm so confident to roll out a solution tonight that nails product market fit. So let me introduce you to that solution we've prepared for you. First, you'll get the chance to learn from the one and only Teresa Torres herself by listening to her talk, The What and Why of Continuous Discovery. Teresa is an internationally acclaimed author, speaker, and coach. 
she has provided invaluable contributions to the product community throughout her blog, producttalk.org, the Product Talk Academy, countless sessions at product conferences, and last but not least, her recently published book. For me personally, Continuous Discovery Habits was one of the most valuable product books I've ever read, as it helped me to structure my approach to product discovery and to finally connect the dots. Right after Re Teresa's talk, you'll get the chance to raise your question in the Q&A to get in touch with the thought leaders of our industry. We planned with plenty of time for this, so feel free to shoot all your questions in the comments as we go. Anya and Sean will pick them up later. Please don't worry if you don't make it into the Q&A with your question. You'll still have a chance to win Teresa's book to dive deeper into easy to understand material. We'll be giving away three copies at the end of the show and everyone who sent a question in the Q&A will be automatically joining the book raffle. So please make sure to stay until the end of the show to not miss out on your price. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've all been waiting for. Let's give a very warm welcome to our special guest for tonight, the international product discovery thought leader, Teresa Torres. Hi, Teresa. Hi, thanks for having me and what a wonderful introduction. <laughs> so the stage is yours, Teresa, and please have fun. Excellent. Well, <laughs> welcome everybody. I'm very excited to be here. Um, as Tobias said in his intro, we will be talking about the what and why of continuous discovery. As we get started, one of the things I would like to share is that the framework and the tools and the tactics that we're going to talk about have been tested around the world. So I've been very fortunate as a discovery coach. I've been able to work with teams of all sizes, from founding teams as small as two, two people all the way through multinational companies with hundreds of thousands of employees in a wide variety of industries. I like to share that because I know it's easy to sit in an audience and think, oh, I get it, this could work at a Facebook or a Netflix or a Google, but it would never work in my context. Um, so I wanna start right off the bat just letting you know that odds are I've worked with a team like yours um, and to instead start to think about, wow, if this is really working in so many contexts, how might I bring it to my organization? All right, so with that disclaimer in place, let's go ahead and dive in. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, continuous discovery. So I just wanna start at the very beginning and talk about what do we mean by discovery? Um, this term is often used in contrast with delivery, where discovery represents um, the work that we're doing to decide what to build, and delivery represents the work that we're doing to build, ship, and maintain a production quality product. It really is that simple. What we're seeing across the industry is business stakeholders are pushing discovery decisions down to the individual product teams, allowing them to make cross-functional decisions about what to build. Now, a lot of us grew up in what I call a project world, where our companies are resourcing projects each year. We kick off a project, we finish it, we move on to the next one. Um, and today, we're gonna talk about how do we shift our discovery from a project mindset to a continuous mindset? Um, and how do we make sure that we're infusing that whole process with customer feedback? And the reason why this shift from project to continuous is so important is we're starting to recognize digital products are never done, we can always iterate on them, we can always improve them. As we saw in 2020 and sadly continuing into 2021, the world is always changing around us and we wanna make sure that we are adaptable and can respond. So I wanna start with just a really clear definition of continuous discovery. So this comes from the book. I define continuous discovery as weekly touch points with customers by the team building the product where they conduct small research activities in pursuit of a desired product outcome. Now this is a mouthful and we're actually gonna break this definition at down line by line. So I wanna start with this continuous cadence. Why should we engage with our customers every week? So as product people, whether we're product managers, designers, software engineers, you, uh, researchers, any of the dozens of roles that support building digital products, we're making decisions every day. Some of those are big strategic decisions, like which opportunities we should go after, which customers we should serve. Others are just more everyday decisions, like what do we label this button? How do we expose this feature in the interface? How should this workflow work? Or what should the underlying data model support? Most of us know that those big strategic decisions need some customer input. 
We tend to do project-based research when it's time to make big strategic decisions, but we forget that our daily decisions can also benefit from customer input. input. And there's a really important reason for this. As product people, as we work on our product day in and day out, we start to develop expertise about what technology supports, how our product works, where everything lives in the interface, what the data model enables. We become experts in our products. The challenge is our customers are not experts in our products. And there's actually a bias called the curse of knowledge that basically says it's easy to forget. We just can't remember what it was like to not have that expert knowledge. So as we make our daily product decisions, we tend to make them from our own expert point of view, and we forget what it's like to not have that expert knowledge. And so the longer we go between customer touch points, the more likely we're making decisions that won't work for our customers. Now the good news is there's a really easy way to fix this, and I really just encourage product teams to engage with their customers at least weekly. So the more often we talk to our customers, the more likely we're gonna see the gap between how we think about the product from our expert point of view and how our customers think about the product from their, from their customer point of view. There's an, another advantage to this weekly cadence. In addition to overcoming the curse of knowledge, it's also gonna help us um, expand our thinking from just a validation mindset to what I call a co-creation mindset. So in a project world, we do a lot of validation research. This is gonna sound familiar. You do all the pixel perfect um, design, production quality design, and when you're done, you validate through usability testing, did we get it right with our customers? Or you build the whole product and delivery, and then at the end, you validate through A-B testing, did we get it right? I'm not criticizing validation research. It's a critical part of our discovery process. We do need to do that research. But the, the challenge with only doing validation research is when we get feedback at the very end of the process, it's really hard to make changes. If we've already built everything and we learn in an A-B test that we're falling short, we have to rewrite code. If we learn late in a usability test that we structured the, the workflow incorrectly, we have to redo all the design. The power of a co-creation mindset is that we're getting feedback before we decide what problems to solve, we're getting feedback when we have pencil sketches, we're getting feedback when we're thinking through how might the product requirements work, and feedback early in the process is easy to act on. It's easy to change a pencil drawing, it's easy to change requirements before we, decide, before we start designing and building. So uh, there's this, this weekly cadence of engaging with customers is powerful for two reasons. It's gonna help us overcome the curse of knowledge and make sure that we make decisions from our customer's point of view, and it's gonna help unlock this co-creation mindset and make sure that we're engaging with customers and getting feedback when it's easier to make changes. Now, whenever I talk about co-creation, inevitably somebody in the audience is thinking about either the Steve Jobs quote where he said, um, customers don't know what they want until we show it to them, or the Henry Ford quote where he said, if I had asked customers what they would have wanted, they would have said a faster horse. So I wanna be really clear here, when I talk about co-creation, I'm not talking about going to our customers and saying, what should we build? The idea with co-creation is to combine our customers' expert knowledge of their own world, their own life, with our knowledge of what's possible with technology, and together co-create better solutions. So in the second half of this talk, we'll get a little bit more into what does it look like to co-create with customers. Okay, so we've tackled this first line of weekly touch points with customers. Let's get into the second line of by the team building the product. It's really critical that we not rely on outsiders to do our research for us. And the team starts with this idea of a product trio. So a product trio is typically comprised of a product manager, a designer, and a software engineer who are jointly responsible for making decisions about what to build. So this team is leading your discovery efforts. And I wanna be clear that they're not the only three people involved in discovery, they're just driving discovery decisions. And I wanna contrast this with what we've historically done. So historically, the product manager works with the business and writes requirements. The requirements get handed off to designers who do all the designs. The requirements and the designs get handed off to engineers who then implement. This is the traditional waterfall model. And for many of us working in agile, in quotes, 
It's also the mini waterfall agile model as well. So let's talk about what's wrong with this model. We see a lot of handoffs. With every handoff, it's like a game of telephone where we're losing context and nuances about the customer. We're moving further away from the customer perspective. We also see a lot of rework. The designer gets the requirements. They run into design constraints. We have to change the requirements. The engineers get the requirements and the design. They run into technical constraints. We have to go back and redo the requirements and redo the design. This is why many projects end up over budget, under scoped, and late. We're recognizing we can overcome a lot of these challenges if we get these three roles collaborating, collaborating together from the very beginning. And if this is the team that's responsible for making decisions about what to build, this is the team we want engaging with customers on a regular basis because this is the team that needs to overcome that curse of knowledge and be continuously reminded that they need to be making decisions from their customer's point of view and not their expert point of view. Now, most of us have more than three roles on our team. We probably have additional engineers. Depending on your DevOps strategy, you might still have QA folks on your team. We also interface with a number of business roles, whether that's data analysts, customer success folks, product marketing managers. Maybe you have the luxury of working with a user researcher. So I wanna be really clear, this concept of a trio is flexible. It can flex based on the roles on your team. So I've met many teams that have quads. If you're on a data heavy product, maybe your data analyst is part of every decision. If you have a user researcher embedded on your team, you probably wanna include them on your core team. What we're trading off with the idea of a trio is speed of decision-making with quality of decision-making. The smaller your decision-making team, the faster you'll go. The more cross-functional roles represented that are required for each decision, the better the decision that you'll make. So for, if you're doing discovery on your go-to-market strategy, you probably want to invite your product marketing manager for those decisions, but they don't need to be involved in every single decision. So again, the trio is flexing based on the type of decision that you're making and based on the roles available to you at your company. Okay, so we've tackled this first half, weekly touch points with customers by the team building the product. The second half of this definition is where we're gonna get into the meat of the talk. What are we doing when we engage with customers on a regular basis? The key here is we're gonna conduct small research activities. So we can't take our big, project-based research and try to jam it into a weekly cadence. We have to adjust our research activities to make them more sustainable week over week. And the goal of those activities is in pursuit of a desired product outcome. And this is really critical. We're not doing research for research sake. We're doing research to drive an outcome. And so this is where I wanna introduce a visual that I use. It's called an opportunity solution tree. This visual was designed to help a team chart the best path to their desired outcome. So this is gonna help ensure that those research activities are in pursuit of a desired outcome. It starts by defining a clear outcome. That's the root of our tree. Now again, I wanna contrast this from what we've historically done, is that product teams have been very output driven. We give teams a roadmap with a list of outputs. What's wrong with this output world? It assumes that we can predict the future. It assumes that we know today what we should be building next month, three months from now, six months from now. Some of us have 12 month roadmaps. Again, in 2020, a lot of teams had to throw out their 12 month roadmaps because the world radically changed overnight. Now, hopefully we're not gonna face a global pandemic on a regular basis, but we see new competitors enter our market. We see technology disrupt our market. Even every code release, every time we release, the, release code to our customers, we're impacting the opportunity space. We're impacting the market. We're influencing customer behavior. And so what we're recognizing when we shift from outputs to outcomes is that we need to be more adaptable. It's not about dictating outputs far into the future where that, that um, etches in what we should be doing when, but instead taking a step back and saying, what's the value we need to create for our business? And I wanna be clear about this, your outcome should rec represent business value. This is how we earn the right to serve our customer over time, right? We have to build a viable product that allows us to pay the bills so that we exist to serve a customer over time. Once that outcome is in place, 
we're looking at how do we discover opportunities that will drive the outcome. The opportunity space is where we're looking at customer value. So we're looking at how can we create value for our customers in a way that will drive business value. So we're aligning customer value and business value. Now outputs still matter. We do have to discover the solutions that will deliver on those opportunities, creating customer value in a way that will drive that outcome, creating business value. So let's talk about how do we do this? How do we discover opportunities? How do we discover solutions? We're gonna use this visual at the heart of the process. We're gonna build it out as we work so that we're continuously visualizing our thinking and staying aligned as a product trio. Again, it starts with defining a clear outcome at the top of your tree. This should be a two-way negotiation between your product leader. By that, I mean your head of product, your VP of product, and your product trio. Why? Why should this be a two-way negotiation? Odds are your product leader is gonna communicate a business outcome because again, we're looking at how do we create business value. The product trio needs to take that business outcome and translate it to a product outcome. A product outcome is a behavior that exists in the product. I'm gonna give you an example of this. I'm gonna use Netflix for my examples, not because they sponsor me or because I've done work with them. I actually have no prior engagements with Netflix, but because people around the world are broadly familiar with how streaming entertainment works and Netflix is in something like 170 countries. So let's imagine that the business leaders at Netflix looked at their, um, all companies start with financial metrics. How do we increase revenue? A key metric for Netflix is gonna be subscriber retention because they're a subscription business. So the product leader might go to the product trio and say, we need you to increase subscriber retention. That's a business outcome, it's a financial metric. The product team needs to translate that to a behavior that exists in the product that would drive that business outcome. So in this Netflix example, that might be increased increase viewing engagement. Their theory is that if we get people more engaged with the platform, they'll retain their subscriptions for a longer period of time. With that outcome in place, we're now gonna look at our first small research activity that we're gonna do on a weekly basis. And that's, we're gonna interview our customers. We're gonna interview every week with the goal of discovering opportunities. Now I wanna be clear, a lot of teams think about interviewing as a way to evaluate solutions I want you to set that aside because we're gonna interview to discover customer needs, customer pain points, and customer opportunities. And we're gonna do this on a weekly basis. Now, the reason why most teams don't do this on a weekly, weekly basis is because it's hard to find people to talk to. Recruiting is the biggest barrier. So I'm gonna recommend that you start by automating your recruiting process. Now, this is gonna sound magical, but I want you to show up to work on Monday morning, look at your calendar, and already have an interview on your calendar without you having to do anything to put it there. This makes interviewing a customer every week easier than not interviewing a customer every week. I'm gonna give you three strategies for how to do this. The first is to recruit people while they're visiting your product or service. Recruit them while you have their attention. There's many ways to do this. The visual you're looking at here is they're just popping up an interstitial to a small percentage of people until they recruit enough people. They're sending them scheduling software so that it automatically ends up on their calendar without them having to be involved. If you do this, it will take some optimization. You'll need to think about it as if any other funnel in your product. So you'll have to optimize where you show it, who you show it to, what you ask for, what incentive, incentive you offer. But I will share 80% of the teams that I work with use this method to automate the recruiting process. It works extremely well for B2C companies and for recruiting B2B end users. Now, if you need to recruit B2B buyers, I'm gonna give you the second strategy. This is where you can use your customer facing teams to help you schedule interviews. So this is your sales teams, your account management teams, your support teams. On a weekly basis, you can define triggers for them where you say, if you talk to a customer who is experiencing this need, please schedule time on our calendar for us to talk with them. Again, you're using the people in the building or virtually from home who are already working with your customers day in and day out to schedule your interviews for you so that they just show up on your calendar. Now I will say probably not, these are rough estimates, but probably 98% of the teams that I work with 
are using a mix and match of these first two methods. There are some instances where your audience might be extremely hard to reach. Now, everybody thinks their customer is extremely hard to reach, so I'm gonna give you two examples. I'm talking about audiences where maybe it's Fortune 500 CEOs and they have very little discretionary time and they're hard to get in front of. Or another example would be um, respiratory ICU physicians and nurses during the height of COVID, right? They're busy, they're overwhelmed, very little discretionary time. If that's what your audience looks like, you can set up a customer advisory board. Here's the way this works. You're gonna build a long-term engagement with a small number of customers. The key is you're not gonna work with them as a focus group, but instead you're gonna do one-on-one -on -one interviews with them. So maybe they're on your advisory board for a year, you, say in, you incentivize them, in exchange for that incentive, they need to participate in an interview every month um, to earn that incentive. If you have three product teams, you can put 12 customers on your advisory board. That gives each team a different customer to talk to 12 weeks in a row. In the 13th week, they're gonna go back and talk to the first customer they talk to. And over the course of the year, they'll have four conversations with the same customer, and every week they'll have a different customer to talk to. These three methods are by far the most common way to automate your recruiting process. I go into much more detail in the book if you need a little bit more how-to. Once you have a customer in the room, we need to look at how do we ask the right questions. The key to interviewing well is to understand how to collect reliable answers. And the key to reliability is to avoid speculative questions. So humans are particularly bad at answering direct questions out of context. So what's a direct question? If I work with my Netflix example, I might want to know what you like to watch, how you decide to watch, where you watch, what device you watch on, who you watch with. These are all direct questions. If I just ask you those questions, your answers are not going to reflect your behavior in reality necessarily. Again, it's not because you're being deceptive. It's because of the way that our brains work. We're not very good at answering direct questions accurately, and that's because cognitive biases interfere. So what we want to do instead is we want to collect specific stories about the past. So I don't want to ask you those who, what, why, how questions. Instead, I want to ask you, tell me about the last time you watched Netflix, and I want to listen for the answers to those questions. So in your story, I want to listen for who were you watching with, how did you decide what to watch, etc. So I'm getting the answers to those direct questions, but I'm getting them grounded in a specific story. The other advantage of this strategy is that stories include the context and nuance of those answers and opportunities emerge from stories. So needs, pain points, and desires show up in the stories. And that's going to allow us to start to map out the opportunity space. Mapping the opportunity space is going to give us a big picture view of how we can create customer value in a way that derives our business value, our, our product outcome. Once we get that big picture view, we can assess and prioritize the opportunity space and choose a target opportunity. When you choose a target opportunity, what I want you to do is to generate many solutions for how you can address that target opportunity and work with your three most promising solutions. Now, this is different from what a lot of us do, right? A lot of us, we start with a customer problem and we jump to the first solution. We say, is this, and we start testing, we do all the right discovery activities. We say, is this idea good or not? We know from decision-making research that this framing is particularly problematic. It exacerbates two biases. The first is the escalation of commitment, where we tend to fall in love with our ideas. The second is the confirmation bias, where we tend to see the evidence that suggests our idea is true and miss the evidence that our idea is problematic. We can avoid this by setting up a compare and contrast decision. We're gonna work with three ideas for the same target opportunity, and we're gonna say which of these ideas look best. This framing tricks our brain into looking at the pros and cons of each idea. This idea of a compare and contrast decision is important enough that I'm gonna give you a quick visual. It's the Summer Olympics right now. This photo is of Usain Bolt. He was once the world's fastest 100 meter runner. If I asked you, is Usain Bolt fast or not, I want you to hear a whether or not question and ask relative to what. What's our compare and contrast decision? 
If I say, is he fast relative to a cheetah? The answer is probably no. If I say, is he fast relative to a Tesla? In the first 100 meters, I would actually pay to see that race. Is he fast relative to other humans? Absolutely. What we're seeing on the right is a compare and contrast decision with a clear front runner. This is what we're looking for when we compare our decisions against each other. Now, the reason why we don't do this is because it's too much work to do project-based research for three different ideas. We can't do pixel perfect design for three different ideas. We don't want to do that much design work until we know which idea is the best idea. We can't build all three ideas and A-B test them. We don't want to do that much delivery work until we know which idea is most promising. So we need to change our research methods. And this is where we're going to get into our second small research activity that we're going to do on a weekly basis to evaluate our solutions. Now to get into this idea, I'm going to return to our Netflix example. I want you to imagine that I interviewed a bunch of Netflix users and one of the opportunities I heard over and over again was I want to watch sports. Netflix is particularly good at TV shows and movies, but not very good at sports. I'm going to generate three potential solutions. The first is a little bit US centric. I'll do my best to describe it. In the United States, we have three local channels, our public broadcast channels, ABC, CBS, and NBC. A lot of our sports are on those local channels. For example, the Olympics are currently being broadcast on NBC. So one way Netflix could solve the I want to watch sports um, opportunity is to integrate those local channels so that people could just watch the sports that are on those local channels. Second solution is we could license games directly from sports leagues. So in Europe, this might, or in the UK, this might be the Premier League or Champions League. Um, it, for Euro Cup, it might be licensing games directly from the Euro Cup organization. The third solution would be to say, we're not very good at sports, let's partner with somebody who is. Fubo TV is particularly good at streaming sports. Maybe we'll bundle our subscriptions. Okay, we have three different ideas for how we might solve the same target opportunity. We can't do big project-based research and build all three. We don't want to do all the design work. We certainly don't want to do all the business development work for all three ideas. What's the key to quickly evaluating multiple solutions so that we can set up a good compare and contrast? We want to break our solutions into their underlying assumptions and quickly test those assumptions. Assumptions come in many categories. We make desirability assumptions. Does anybody want this solution? Are they willing to do what we need them to do? We make viability assumptions. Will this be good for the business? If we're an outcome focused team, will it drive our outcome? We make feasibility assumptions. Can we build it? Is it technically possible? Do we have the necessary skills? We make usability assumptions. Can people use it? Do they understand it? Can they find it? Are they able to do what we need them to do? And we make ethical assumptions. Is there any potential harm? This is where we should be looking at what data are we collecting? Are we storing it correctly? Are we using it in ethical ways? Are our customers okay with that? This is also where we can look at social justice issues. Who are we deciding to serve? And as a result, who are we leaving out? What assumptions are we making about our target customers? Are we replicating the social inequities we see in our communities in the products that we're building? Knowing these five categories will help you generate assumptions but we're often blind to our own assumptions. So story mapping will help you uncover hidden assumptions. If you're not familiar with story mapping, it's the yellow boxes on this slide. I'm gonna start with, we're gonna assume our solution already exists and you're gonna map out what does a customer need to do to get value from this solution. So in the case of integrating local channels into Netflix, our customer has to decide to watch the game. They have to choose a streaming service. They have to open that service. They have to choose a local channel and they have to watch the game. What I'm doing in the gray boxes below is for each step I'm asking what needs to tr be true in order for my customer to do that step. This is how I'm generating assumptions. Some of the assumptions are going to be shared across all of my ideas. For example, this is assumption subscribers want to watch sports is going to be shared by all three of my ideas. If I test that assumption, it turns out not to be true. It's telling me that I chose the wrong opportunity. Some of my assumptions, the ones over under find a local channel, are differentiating this solution from my other solutions. 
if I test these assumptions, this is what's going to give me my compare and contrast data. Now, the value of testing assumptions is that it's quicker than testing whole ideas. So I'm going to give you four quick strategies for how to rapidly test assumptions. The first is we are going to prototype to simulate a specific moment. I want to emphasize we're not prototyping pixel perfect design for the whole idea. We're looking at the moment in which the assumption occurred in the story map and we're prototyping to test just that moment. So in this case, I want to know what do you want to watch right now? I'm just prototyping that specific moment. I don't need a pixel perfect design. I'm just going to give you some options. Here's some TV shows. Here's some movies. Here's some sporting events. What would you like to watch right now? I'm going to post this on an unmoderated testing tool and I can get a response. I can run this entire test in 24 hours. So I'm not doing pixel perfect design. I'm not scheduling um, a dozen people to do a prototype test. I'm not taking weeks to evaluate this solution. I'm getting a an answer tomorrow. Second way I can test this assumption is I can launch a one question survey. One question surveys live within your product. You're capturing people's attention while, they, while you have it and you're asking the key to one question surveys is to ask the right question. So again, we're asking about specific instances in the past. So we're not saying, do you like, do you like sports? Do you want to watch sports? Those are hypothetical, ambiguous, direct questions. Instead, we're saying, have you watched a sporting event in the past week? As long as you have any amount of traffic to your site, you can collect a large number of results. In, if you have a lot of traffic in an hour or two, if you have less traffic, it might take a day or two. You can still quickly evaluate, is there risk in this assumption? Third way we can test this assumption is to ask, are our customers already exhibiting the behavior we would expect to see? We have all sorts of data we can look at. We can look at behavioral analytics. We can look at search queries. We can look at support tickets. We can talk to our sales teams. In our Netflix example, we can look at our customers already searching for sports. Here's what I'm going to tell you. I can do this in an hour or two, right? I'm looking for evidence that my assumption might be true. Here's what I'm going to tell you. These first three methods, prototyping a specific moment, running a one question survey, using existing data to evaluate the evidence, is going to cover the vast majority of assumptions that, you, that your ideas depend upon. This is the fastest way to quickly evaluate which solutions look most promising. There is a fourth type of assumption test that I'm going to introduce that's going to work really well for your, re, for your feasibility assumptions. It, what would it take to build this? Is it possible? Do we have time? We can do a research spike. Now, many teams do research spikes and they give their a research type bot, a research spike is just a time boxed activity where you tell your teams to go investigate something. Many teams do this when they get an epic story, right? The teams estimate it as an eight if you're using the Fibonacci sequence or extra large if you're using t-shirts and you want your teams to go dig in and figure out how do we break this up? How do we make it smaller? That's a very open ended research spike. When we're testing specific feasibility assumptions, I want you to narrow the focus of the research spike. So I'm going to give you an example. Let's say we want to integrate a feed from Netflix or from Eurocup. And we want to know, can they give us appropriate metadata so that we can expose the events in our interface? Do they give us appropriate titles? Do they give us appropriate descriptions? Is the image the right size? This is a very specific feasibility assumption and we're going to have our engineers go investigate for how much, for how many events are we getting reliable data? You give them a day or two, they come back with an answer. As we test our feasibility assumptions, we not only get compare and contrast data, which solution is going to work best in the shortest amount of time, we also get better engineering estimates. Okay. We just covered a lot of ground very quickly, so I'm going to do a quick recap. We started at the top with defining a clear outcome. This represents business at value. The first small research activity we're doing on a weekly basis is interviewing to discover opportunities. Opportunities are customer needs, pain points, and desires. They're coming from customer stories about past behavior. Once we choose a target opportunity, we're setting up a compare and contrast solution decision. We're looking at our three top solutions. We're breaking them down into underlying assumptions with story mapping, and we're rapidly testing our assumptions with prototype tests, one question surveys, data mining, and research spikes. 
A good continuous discovery team is continuously interviewing and continuously assumption testing, building out this opportunity solution tree as they work, finding the best path to their desired outcome. They're creating customer value in a way that drives business value. Now, because we covered a lot of ground really quickly, I do wanna share everything that we covered is included in my book, Continuous Discovery Habits. This is available on amazon.com in both paperback and Kindle. It's also available at independent bookstores. If they don't carry it in their inventory, you can ask them to order it. It's available through print on demand. Um, so it should be available anywhere you buy books. Um, I wrote this book to be a hands-on practical guide for product trios who want to put these practices, who want to put these habits into practice. All right, thank you. I think we're ready for some questions. Fantastic. Uh, thanks so much, Teresa, uh, for a talk that covered, I think, quite a big breadth uh, of, of things that we work on within Discovery. Uh, we have lots of questions from the audience. Um, I will give a quick reminder to everyone before I dive into them um, that, you know, please use this opportunity to ask in the chat uh, questions to Teresa. This is a, you know, a good chance to speak to someone that, uh, you know, people pay good money to hear the opinion from. Um, and also, if it, that's not enough motivation on its own, we also have a prize draw going on. So we're giving away copies of Teresa's excellent book. Um, and if you en enter a question into the chat, then this will also enter you into the prize draw. Uh, so we're going to start with a question on the topic of uh, the customer recruitment for this discovery process, um, which you touched on during the talk. Uh, so uh, Lucas asks, how do you reward your customers for their time when they participate in the continuous discovery process without influencing their feedback on the research itself? Yeah, this is a really good question. So incentives are, are a pretty complex topic. So the first thing I'm going to, and I'm going to argue both sides, which might be a little bit confusing, and that's simply because it's messy, right? So first of all, in a lot of instances, you don't have to compensate people. If you uncover a real pain point, especially in a B2B context, a lot of your customers are gonna be willing to talk to you about that because they want you to solve the problem. In a, B2B, in a B2C context, we usually have to compensate. You can compensate with cash in a B2C context. In a B2B context, cash is rarely gonna work. So what are other things we can incentivize with? We can incentivize with things like um, access to premium helplines, access to exclusive webinars, white papers, right? The key here is to think about how can I give you value that's um, in line with the value I'm getting from you. And this is where I'm going to argue the other side. So as people think about incentives as a way to get people in the room, which sometimes you will have to do, a lot of times you don't have to incentivize people to get them in the room. That's a misunderstanding. If you're in a B2B context, you probably do not have to incentivize to get people in the room. Where I think it's important to look at incentives is that we are extracting value from our customers. And I think ethically, we need to reward them for that value. And particularly when we're looking at underrepresented populations. So it's, this is where it's a little bit of a complex question of like, you probably don't have to incentivize as much as you need to get them in the room if you're solving a real problem. And you should, um, it, you should incentivize to appropriately, appropriately compensate for the value that you're getting in return. And that's a judgment call. You're gonna have to look at, you're giving me something valuable, how do I give you something valuable in return? And it just takes experimentation. I, actually, I do wanna comment on one other thing, because in the question there is a concern about, are we influencing the research? And I actually think if you separate the incentive to get them in the room, which I, in a, especially in a B2B context, I don't think you need to do, you can offer the incentive at the end as a reward for the value that they're giving you. And um, you remove some of that issue. In a B2C context, we do have some challenges around um, professional testers or professional interviewers, and you might be getting garbage um, responses. And that's really where you need to do a good job of screening and make sure that you're, you're building your screener in a way that you're filtering out those professional testers. If you have never done any interviewing, I don't want you to worry about this question at all. The vast majority of people that you talk to are going to be customers who want to help. It's only when you're doing this at high volume that you're going to run into these challenges. Thank 
Sounds good. Uh, Simon has a similar question, but it goes into a different direction in regards to the difference researching or interviewing between B2C and B2B. Because in a B2B context, the user is not necessarily your customer. Yeah, so a lot of people like, I think, overemphasize the difference between B2B and B2C. In both instances, we have different roles in the ecosystem that we need to design for. So let's take Facebook, a B2C company. They have multiple roles they're designing for. They have um, end users and they have advertisers. Let's take Netflix. They have subscribers and they have content providers. Now let's take a B2B context. We have end users and we have buyers, right? So almost everybody is managing complex ecosystems where there's different roles. What we sometimes see in a B2B context is maybe the buyer doesn't want us to work with the end user. So there's a little bit of a gatekeeper. And so we have to work with the buyer to overcome that gatekeeper role and help them see that they actually benefit from us working with the end users. Another difference is what we were just talking about is your incentives might look a little bit different. Most companies don't want their employees taking gifts. So we can't compensate with cash or gift cards, right? We have to look at how do we provide value to the business and not to the individual. Whereas in a B2C context, we're compensating the individual. Um, other ways, there are other subtle differences, but I would say for the most part, they're, they're more similar than they are different. Thank you. Okay. So for the next question from Pauline, um, why would we not generate assumptions first based on the insights and then create solutions um, as it's easier to test assumptions? Yeah, so you... You might have noticed in my example that some of the assumptions were actually at the opportunity level. So subscribers want to watch sports is directly tied to this opportunity of I want to watch sports or like subscribers want to watch sports on Netflix is directly tied to the opportunity. So there will be assumptions that are independent of the solutions and you actually can generate those assumptions at the opportunity level. In my experience working with teams, Teams are really anxious to get to solutions as quickly as possible. And I actually think we want to test opportunity assumptions in parallel with compare and contrast solution assumptions. Because as soon as you get, get into the solution space, we actually learn a lot about the opportunity space. So I want to see teams getting there as quickly as possible. Um, but your uh, insight in your question is spot on which is there are assumptions that occur before we get to solutions. Um, but I want to see you testing those assumptions in parallel with your compare and contrast solution mm -hmm. assumptions. Cool. Dominic from Munich would like to know, what is your notion of continuous for hardware products? As an Internet of Things company, we always wonder how we can apply this regardless of given that hardware has a launch moment? Yeah, I get this question a lot. So I, here's what I'm gonna tell you. The vast majority of teams that I have worked with work on digital products. I have worked with some teams that work on digital products that interface with a hardware product, like Internet of Things types products. And we've looked at how do we infuse this process in the physical space as well. It's a lot more challenging. Your turnaround times are gonna be slower, but it's not impossible. So there's a lot of really good case studies. Like I know there's a case study, maybe it comes from GE, about how they did all the discovery for a new refrigerator in six months, a process that historically took years, right? So I don't have all of the answers for you on this because we're getting a little bit outside of um, the depth of my experience, but I know, but here's what I will tell you. The framework was developed based on decision-making research, problem-solving research, and critical thinking research. So I do think it is broadly applicable. I think there are ways to take these ideas and translate them to the hardware space, um, but it does take work and it's not gonna be as simple. Like you may not be able to prototype and get assumption feedback in a few days. It might have to be a few weeks. But if today it's a few years, the key principle is how do we shorten the feedback cycle so we can get more iterations in? Okay, so we have a question from Michelle. Um, which is how would you explain to marketing and sales students the importance of first discovering the customer problem or need and then generating multiple ideas instead of the other way around? 
and I would guess this could also be broadened to really anyone in the organization um, outside of uh, product or design directly. Yeah, so let's let's break this down a little bit. So most humans, including product people, think in solutions. That's just the way that our brains work. Like our brains make fast inferences, right? An inference is just your chain of logic from, we start from A, how do we get to C? We make fast inferences, A to B, B to C. We're not even aware that B exists because our brain jumps from A to C super fast. So what's happening, the reason why we think in solutions it's because we hear a customer problem, or we hear it. We hear a customer request, which, by the way, was a fast inference. The customer had problem, had a, had a, ran into a challenge. They jumped past B, which was the framing of that challenge, straight to a solution C. So our job is to uncover that inference and to uncover the oppor the, the missing opportunity. The reason why this is valuable. Let's take the sales context. Sales is working with one customer at a time. They're trying to close every opportunity. Customer A suggests I need X. Customer B suggests I need Y. Customer Z suggests, or customer C suggests I need Z. Okay, we have three feature requests. If we do the work to uncover the implied opportunity, we might realize there are three different solutions that all save the, the solve the same problem. And instead of building three things, we can build one thing. That's the first thing. We can reduce the amount that we have to build if we uncover the implied opportunities. The second thing, our customers are not experts in technology. So most likely they're not requesting the right thing, right? So we can come up with a better solution. So a lot of this of how do we get other people on board is helping expose the inferences that are being made, how we can examine them and how we can work together to build better versions and less stuff. And if we build better versions and less stuff, we end up with a better product. We cover more of the opportunity space. When we cover more of the opportunity space, we uncover more of the market. Now, so that's the how, but I will tell you, this is not going to change overnight. You're not gonna sit down and convince your salespeople overnight, right? We are, swim we are changing business culture. We are leading business culture with this stuff. And so we also have to be patient and recognize Sometimes we're just gonna to have to take feature requests. You can still story map them. You can still test assumptions. When you run into problems, that's a really great time to say, hey, this solution isn't gonna work. What's the problem we're trying to solve? How else could we solve that problem? So you can use, you can meet people where they are, test their solution, and then when there's problems, work up to what's the opportunity, what's the outcome. Cool. Doris is asking, what's your advice on including discovery into the roadmap? And after some discussion with the audience, I think she wants to make clear the work that's going into discovery and how to make that effort transparent. Yeah, so I actually shared an example of a now, next, later roadmap or a now, next, future roadmap um, on my blog. So if you go to Product Talk and you look for, it was the first post of the year, it was from January. It's called something like a look at the year ahead in 2021. I actually shared my own personal um, now next future roadmap. And here's what it looked like. In the now column, I had a target opportunity. The, my target opportunity was a product trio saying, I don't know what to do when in discovery. And I listed my solutions that were currently in flight. So what were those solutions? My book, which I almost had a release date for back in January. Um, I think I put it as early spring, late summer, or late spring, early summer. Not sure, I didn't have an exact release date yet. Um, and then uh, I have, I had an idea already of a membership program that we launched um, along with the book to help people know what to do when. And I listed that, but I didn't list specifics because I wasn't ready to announce it just yet. And then in the next column, I had an opportunity of, um, I want to develop my in, an individual discovery skill because that was the next opportunity I was going to tackle. I had existing solutions for that opportunity. We have a continuous interviewing course, a defining outcomes course, an opportunity mapping course, and I knew we were going to launch additional courses, but I had no idea when. In fact, we still haven't launched them and I still don't have release dates for them, but I listed them of we're going to launch an identifying hidden assumptions course and a testing assumptions course. So my now and my next column included target opportunities and known solutions that I'd be exploring. 
And if they were currently in development, like the book, they had tentative release dates. My future column had an opportunity only, which is I have an opportunity if I want to help leaders know how to manage teams who are working this way. I have no idea what those solutions are going to look like. But here's what that roadmap allows me to do. It lets people know this is what I'm working on right now. These are the solutions you can expect in the short term. My next column is the opportunity I'm planning to explore in the future. Uh, next, those, uh, those solutions are a little bit hazier. The timeline's a little, even more hazier. I might throw them all out and bring in new solutions based on what I learn. And my future is just, this is what I think is queued up next. I have no idea what the solutions look like because we haven't even started to explore them. And then that's it. That's what I know today. And then I can roll through those columns as I move along in time. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. So we have uh, this question from Bjorn about um, existing products. So do you see value in doing continuous interviews also in teams that are mostly doing maintenance of existing products? Yes. And that's because products are never done. Even products that are towards the end of their life cycle. How do you know when they're at the end of the life cycle if you're not continuously talking to customers? How do you know that you don't have a critical bug that's interfering with their workflow if you're not continuously talking to customers? How do you know that that product doesn't have adjacent market potential that could be really valuable if you're not continuously talking to your customers? So here's the reality. If you're shipping code, you should be talking to customers. And actually, I would argue even if you're not shipping code, if you have a dormant product, you still should be talking to customers because maybe that product, is, maybe you're ready to end that, that light, the life of that, you're ready to sunset that product, but maybe you have a subset of customers that are completely dependent on that product that you could learn about and turn it into a more viable product and extend its life. So I will share, I can't think of a single instance when I don't think Product Trio should be talking to customers. It's a very decisive answer. <laughs> Thank you. And we had a very related question. Just see where it went. Um, here it is. Um, about continuous interviewing and how you balance between continuous interviewing and dedicated UX research studies? Yeah, this is a great question. I just recorded a little five minute video answering this question. Um, so if you wanna watch the video, you can check it out at producttalk.org. It's our most recent blog post, but I'll also give you the highlights. Um, a lot of companies have centralized user research teams. User research really grew up from external design agencies. And so we learned to work with them on a project basis. Here's what I'm gonna tell you. We need project research. We need teams working on a longer horizon um, cadence than product teams. Product teams work on a weekly cadence. We're trying to ship value continuously to our customers. And so we need to get fast answers to weekly questions. Businesses also have long horizon questions. Where's the market going? What's our customer, how, what are the major trends in customer behavior over time, right? So we need both. And product teams should be leveraging that project-based research. They just shouldn't only rely on that project-based research because we need to make sure that our daily decisions also are getting feed, are getting input from customers. So we need both. Cool. Uh, so we have a question from um, Arnie, one of the co-organizers. Um, who I guess is also pitching in for the for the raffle. <laughs> um, so he asks, uh, for larger organizations, do you recommend to merge specific opportunity solution trees of individual teams into one uh, bigger picture? Um, and I should also mention that I like this question a lot because I have experienced this firsthand and wasn't sure what to do either. So uh, yeah, curious to hear what you have to say. Yeah, I get this question a lot. So Arnie, thank you for that. I think it's a natural question right, is that we're visualizing a single team's work. How do we visualize work across our teams? I will share though, I've tried to do this in a lot of companies and I don't think it works. So I think the opportunity solution tree is really great for here's a single outcome, how might we reach it? I think we need a vi different visual for here's what all of our teams are working on, 
How do we visualize that? And I think that's more of an outcome map. How do we, how do we connect the dots between how all of the outcomes across our teams cascade and connect and support our financial metrics, right? So one of the things I do with teams um, in our masterclass is to, to find a good outcome. We start with all businesses are trying to grow profit. The inputs to profit are increased revenue, decreased costs. The inputs to increase revenue are based on your business model. So what are the key metrics related to your business model? And then you can look at how does the product support those business model metrics. So in the Netflix example, your business model metrics are customer acquisition, retention, reducing churn, because those all are all, all inputs to lifetime value, right? And then your product outcomes, how does the product support those metrics? It's probably some combination of engagement and satisfaction over time. So with that big picture, and then you might break engagement down by team. You might have a search team and a, and a recommendations team and a browsing team. So you're building out this big outcome map that's helping you see how your team's work is coordinated. But I haven't seen it work very well when you push that down into opportunities and into solutions because it's just too messy. Mm -hmm. Really the same opportunity can support multiple outcomes and the same solution can support multiple outcomes. And now you get into trying to build the same thing for everybody. Whereas I would rather a team when they're building a solution hyper focus on this is most important for driving this single outcome and then to coordinate the work at the mm. outcome level. Yeah. And just to kind of add to the question, um, if you're in a scenario where you do have a specific uh, outcome that's defined, but then the opportunity solution tree that comes out of it is very broad, like lots and lots of opportunities or layers. Um, how do you respond to something like that? What's your uh, next line of action? Yeah, so this is the idea of cascading outcomes, right? If your opportunity space is really large and it's too hard for a single team to manage, you can split the opportunity space by splitting the outcome. In fact, I just finished reading um, the book Ask Your Developer from the CEO of Twilio, which by the way is a phenomenal book. And he talks about how once a team gets bigger than 10 people, they split the team. And that he talks about each team fully owns their own code base because they're doing microservices and they, they plan that split like six months in advance so they can completely separate those code bases. And I think a great way to plan that split is to split your outcome, right? So if, for example, you have a team that's focused on um, increasing engagement with customers, you could split them by increased first time engagement, increased return engagement, or you could split them by um, increase engagement with this part of the product or increase engagement with this part of the product. So there's lots of ways to split an outcome. And we do want to make sure that each team has their own opportunity space to explore and their own outcome because that's what allows them to truly be an empowered team. And then I think the Twilio CEO, CEO is taking that one step further and saying they also need to fully own their code base um, to truly be an empowered team. Nice. Thank you. We have a similar question from Patrick, uh, also uh, addressing large product organizations. And his concern is that not every team is approaching, uh, or the different teams approaching the same people with similar questions. Yeah, so if you're recruiting by emailing a bunch of customers, you're going to run into this problem, right? Some customers are going to get 17 emails and they're going to get frustrated. If you automate your recruiting process, notice how with automating the recruiting process, the customer is opting in, right? You're asking them in the product, do you want to engage with a, with a customer? You can also track like through whatever CRM software you're using that they already, they already had an interview recently. And if you're using any of the millions of tools that allow us to put that ask in the product, you can take that into account. So if you automate your recruiting process, it actually makes it really easy to make sure that we're not pestering our customers over and over again, because you can use software to solve this problem. So we have one about uh, time balance. Of course, this is one of maybe the most fundamental challenges with people actually doing discovery is how do they balance their time? Uh, so particularly in this case for the discovery trio between the delivery work and the discovery work. Yeah, so this is, I think, the beauty of continuous discovery. It's not a different phase. So it's not we're going to spend two weeks in discovery and two weeks in delivery, right? So we're throwing that out the door. We're discovering always, we're delivering always. So now we might look at, like, in a given week, how many hours am I spending in discovery? How many hours am I spending in delivery? 
To be honest, I don't really know how to answer that question because I don't know how to distinguish the work. So let me give an example. If you're continuously interviewing, I can tell you, you can do an interview in 20 to 30 minutes. I also recommend you synthesize that interview immediately afterwards. In the book, I include an interview snapshot that teaches you how to do that synthesis. So if you're doing a 20 to 30 minute interview, maybe it's a 45 minute meeting on your calendar to conduct the interview and immediately do the snapshot. While you're learning, it might take a full hour, right? So we've got 45 minutes to an hour on the calendar to continuously interview. If you've automated your recruiting process, that is 100% of the time it takes to discover opportunities. Now, assumption testing. Where do we draw the line between assumption testing and delivery? Honestly, I have no idea. In the, when we're working with a set of solutions, we're gonna test some early assumptions. We, we might prototype with unmoderated testing tools. We might run one question surveys. All of these tasks don't take a lot of time, right? Your designer might spend an hour um, do, doing a not pixel perfect production quality prototype, launching an unmoderated testing tool. The next day, the team might divide and conquer and spend 30 minutes processing results. You might run a one question survey. It takes 20 minutes to get it live. It takes three minutes to look at the results, right? An engineer might spend an hour looking at search queries and analyzing them. Assumption testing does not take a lot of time. And as you assumption test, you're iterating your way into the delivery process, right? A lot of your assumption tests will turn into live production tests. So now where's the line between discovery and delivery? We started delivering to discover. So I don't, on the assumption testing side, I can't tell you four hours in discovery, the rest of your week in delivery. What happens in practice is your discovery work leads to delivery work. They're fused together. And this just becomes the way you're working. Just one follow-up question to that one. Um, how do you make sure, and you mentioned handoffs uh, versus collaboration earlier, on, um, that the delivery team, the Scrum team maybe, doesn't feel like they're handed off the so solutions? Yeah, so I want to be clear. We don't have a discovery team and a delivery team. The team that is building the product is doing the discovery. It's led by the trio, right? That doesn't mean the rest of the team isn't involved in discovery at all. We want every single person on the team to have exposure to customers. They're probably not interviewing every week. I would, I would think about how do you get your engineers in front of customers monthly, maybe rotate through having them sit in on interviews, share videos with them, share snapshots with them. So that's the first thing. Every single person on the team should have firsthand exposure to customers. There's lots of ways to do that. Second thing, the trio needs to continuously communicate what they're learning and discovery. So we're not going to our sprint planning meeting, sharing user stories and sharing the discovery for the first time. The rest of the team needs to follow the learning journey as it's happening. You can build this into your regular scrum rituals in your daily standups. You can have someone give an update. We did an interview yesterday. You can find the snapshot in this Slack channel. Or we ran an assumption test. You can find the results in this Slack channel, right? We can use things like Slack or MS Teams to asynchronously communicate, here's what we're learning, so the rest of the team can follow along as you're learning it. So we want the team to be exposed to all the twists and turns, all the variations we tried. So by the time they see the requirements, they know exactly why they're building that and why that was the winner. Nice. I think we have time for one more quick question. What do you recommend in terms of tooling for your trees, Myro, or anything else? Yeah. Patrick? Yeah. So this is, I get this question a lot. Um, there, we have a million tools for this. I think it's really important that each tool, each team find the tool that works for them. I can tell you that I work with teams that use Miro, some use Mural, some use Lucidchart, some use um, Figma. Here's what I would look for. All three people on the trio need to be familiar with the tool so that all three people can make edits and that it's truly a collaborative process. So don't use Figma if your designer is the only one who uses Figma. Don't use Miro if, for example, your company doesn't let you uh, have data outside your company. So you're going to have to look at what's the right tool for your team. The key, it should be dead simple to draw boxes and arrows, and it should be easy for everybody on the team to make edits. Now, I do hear from people all the time who say, I don't like doing it in Miro because my tree is messy and I have to constantly move things around. 
That will be true early in the process. When you're still figuring out the right structure for your tree, you will move things around a lot. But with time, your opportunity space will start to stabilize and you'll have less of those moves. So I would say don't abandon a tool because that early stage is hard. It will get easier, it will stabilize. Thank you very much. And yeah, unfortunately we're out of time for more question, but uh, Teresa, thank you so much. It was a great pleasure having you today. And let me say thank you on behalf of our audience who will probably love to give you a big virtual hand right now because I'm sure everybody's inspired and learned. And if they haven't read the book, I'm sure they will. And if they don't have it or own it yet, they uh, have now the chance to win one. So Teresa, thanks a lot. Congrats to this amazing and successful book and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun and thanks for all the great questions. Thank you. So thanks from our side as well. So Elena and myself, we are going to start the book raffle in just a second. I'm just waiting for a signal from the notary that we are done with all the legal aspects so that it's a proper randomized lottery. Yeah, I got the signal that we can go. So ladies and gentlemen, it's now your chance to win the best product books in one of the best product books in history. It's time for the book raffle. Yeah, there we are for the book raffle. So I hope you are as excited as I am. So we got the proper lottery wheel here with us. And now it's so exciting. We gonna draw three um, people who ask questions and can win this awesome book, Continuous Discovery Habits. Elena, are you as excited as I am? I am as excited as you are. <laughs> Wonderful. You're not as blue as I am. Uh, science, <laughs> sorry. So let's start with the first winner of tonight. I think we are good to go. There's our first number. Elena, we got the number nine as our first winner. Who is that? Number nine is Pauline Bridderon. Congratulations, Pauline. Um, that's a, yes. <laughs> Great Wednesday. Uh, so Pauline and any of the other winners to claim your prize, please get in touch with Tobias via Sing or LinkedIn um, or any of us if you can't find him and we will sort out getting your prize to you. Do that. Sing is preferred for sure. So we continue. I'm so excited. The second winner of tonight in our legendary lottery is number six. Who is that, Elena? Drum roll six is Doris Langenberg. Congratulations. Congratulations. Doris. Woo! <laughs> okay. And the third book goes to number 14. Number 14. Uh, B. Tomio. You know who you are. Congratulations. Please get in touch with <laughs> Tobias to claim your book. B. Tonio. Yeah, get in touch. So congratulations to all the three winners. And you'll get the chance to dive deeper into the topic of tonight, into 
product discovery by reading continuous discovery habits. Let's bring everybody back on stage to say goodbye to the audience. So bye bye and thanks everybody for joining us tonight. We hope we've achieved our desired outcome to help the product community up their discovery game. Stay happy and healthy and see you next time for another inspiring product tank in Berlin or in Hamburg. Exactly. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Take thanks. Care. Bye bye. Thanks for watching.